Today's reading is from Isaiah chapter 55, uh, the whole chapter, verses 1 to 13. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labour on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me, listen, that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, with my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a ruler and a commander to the peoples. Surely you will summon people you know not, and nations you do not know will come running to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out of my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out with joy and be led forth in peace, and the mountains and the hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the juniper, and instead of the briars, the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign that will endure forever. Over the past few months, there's been quite a lot of talk about Greek gods and goddesses in our house. My daughter is learning about ancient Greece at school, and she also recently watched the film Wonder Woman, while my son has recently finished a book he got for Christmas, um, Stephen Fry, Mythos, The Greek Myths Retold. And he really enjoyed reading it. They're both actually really enjoying stories about Greek gods and goddesses, like Zeus and Athena. In part, I think, because they're so full of sex and violence, of romance and adventure. See, a lot of the gods of ancient Greece are a mixture of Marvel superheroes and characters from a pretty crazy soap opera. And as a result, well, they're a lot of fun to read about. Here's how Stephen Fry describes the gods and goddesses of ancient Greece. No one loves and quarrels, desires and deceives as boldly or brilliantly as Greek gods and goddesses. They are like us, only more so. Their actions and adventures scrawled across the heavens above. That's a great description of Greek goddesses and gods. They are like us, only more so. See, the gods of ancient Greece are just bigger, badder, sometimes scarier versions of us. But I wonder, is that how you sometimes think of the god Christians believe in? Is God just a bigger, more powerful version of us? Is the God of the Bible ultimately just like us, only scarier and with higher moral standards? 
See, I suspect that left to our own devices, that's how a lot of us naturally think about the God of the Bible. See, we presume we know how he feels about us. We presume we know how he'll respond to us and therefore we work really hard to keep him happy with us. Well, we're looking at our next bit of the Old Testament book of Isaiah today, Isaiah chapter 55. And I want us to see from this chapter, Isaiah has a message for us about the God of the Bible that we all need to hear. And it's this, the God of the Bible, the God who made us and the God who loves us is utterly unlike us in his grace and his mercy. And that is very, very good news for us when we realize just how much we need his grace and his mercy in our lives. See, if you take the time to read the book of Isaiah as a whole, you quickly discover that one of Isaiah's great passions is the holiness of God. So back at the beginning of the book in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah has a vision of God's holiness that overwhelms him. He gets to listen in to the worship of the angels in heaven as they cry out day and night, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. That's Isaiah chapter 6 verse 3. And throughout the book, Isaiah's favourite title for God is the Holy One of Israel. He uses that title 30 times in the book, including verse 5 of the chapter we're looking at today. Just look at the end of verse 5. The Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. See, again and again, Isaiah confronts his readers with the reality of just how holy the living God is. But we need to ask the question, what does it mean for God to be holy? See, often when the Bible describes God as being holy, it's referring to his moral purity. So God is morally perfect. He's utterly good in everything he does, unlike us. So it's because of God's holiness that our sin and our selfishness are such a big deal. It's because of God's holiness that our sin needs to be dealt with, paid for and removed by the saving work of Jesus in his life, death and resurrection for us. See, that's one meaning of the word holy. When the Bible describes God as holy, it's referring to his moral purity. But there's another sense in that word holy that I think is Isaiah's emphasis in chapter 55. And it's this, when the Bible describes God as holy, It's referring to God's sheer otherness. To put it another way, the reason God is described as holy is because God is not like us. God is not like you or me. The God of the Bible is not just a bigger version of us like the Greek gods and goddesses. No, God is utterly different to us. That is what Isaiah means here when he describes God as holy. And the good news Isaiah has for all of us in this chapter is that the place where we see and experience most clearly just how different God is to us is in how he responds to us in our sin, in our shame, in the times when we have made a mess of our lives. See, the message of Isaiah 55 for all of us today is this. God doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. God doesn't treat us the way we often treat each other. He doesn't reject us. He doesn't give up on us. He doesn't keep his distance from us. No, God welcomes us. God forgives us. God speaks words of life and hope to us. And he responds to us in these amazing ways because he's the God who has sent his son Jesus into the world to save us and welcome us into his family forever. So let's look at Isaiah 55 together now. Now the first thing we learn about the God of the gospel here is in verses 1 to 5. God welcomes the thirsty and the poor through Jesus. God welcomes the thirsty and the poor through Jesus. Verses 1 to 5. 
Now the chapter begins with with God calling out to us as if he's a street vendor or the owner of a new restaurant looking for new customers in the street. And notice there's a real sense of excitement in his voice. Verses 1 to 2. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you have no money. Come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labour on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest of fare. See, in these verses, we're being invited to a banquet by the God of grace. It's an amazing picture. Now, after the year we've all just had, it can be hard to remember what it's like to enjoy a meal with a large group of family or friends. I'm pretty sure my table manners have gone badly downhill in the last year. So apologies if I eat with you in the months ahead and I'm just dripping stuff out of my mouth. But actually, think back to a time when you were at a meal with a group of family or friends, and it was just a joy to be together. Maybe it was a birthday party, or a wedding, or a Christmas day. Now, why is sharing a meal with people you love so special? Well, because when you think about it, sharing a meal together is really all about relationships. When someone invites you for a meal, what they're saying is, you're welcome here. We are friends. We are family. I want to spend time with you. See, I want us to see in verses one to five, that is what the God of grace is saying to each one of us here. Again, look at verses one to two again. Who is invited to this banquet by God? Well, the answer is, it's the thirsty and the poor. So you can't buy an invitation to this banquet. You don't get to pay for it. You just have to accept God's invitation by admitting that you're hungry and thirsty without him. Again, look at verse 2 again. See, God invites people to his banquet who have made poor choices in the past. He, He asks them, he reminds them, why spend money on what is not bread? And your labour and what does not satisfy. See, God knows that each one of us has looked to satisfy our hunger in all the wrong places. We've looked to false gods to save and satisfy us rather than the living God. But you see, even though God knows we've chased after these other things, these other gods, even though God knows we made a mess of things by doing so, he doesn't walk away from us. Instead, he invites us to come to him and be welcomed by him. He invites us into a saving relationship with himself. So these verses are clear. God is inviting us all to a lavish banquet here. Look at verse 2 again. Listen, listen to me, he says, and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest of fare. See, God is offering us here food that will do us good, food that will delight and satisfy us. Look at verse 1. He isn't content with just giving us water to drink. No, he offers us wine and milk, drinks considered a luxury in Isaiah's day. See, God promises to satisfy our thirst. He is lavishly generous with his people. And if we begin to ask the all-important question at this point, but who's going to pay for all this? Well, the answer comes in verses 3 to 5. Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of David, is going to pay for all this. See, we can accept the free gift of God's grace Because Jesus has paid the price for our forgiveness in full. Our invitation to God's banquet has been purchased by Jesus. See, it's striking in these verses that alongside the emphasis that the banquet we're invited to is completely free to us, the verb to buy is repeated throughout verses 1 to 2. See, God's reminding us here, there is a cost 
to his grace. There's a price to be paid for this amazing welcome, but it's not a price we have to pay. It's a price that is paid for us by Jesus at the cross. Again, look at verse 3 for a moment and it's reference to David. So King David, he had been ancient Israel's greatest king, but he died a few hundred years before Isaiah was writing these words. So the reference to God's everlasting covenant with David in verse 3 is here to lift our eyes forward to David's great descendant, Jesus. Great David's greater son, the one who pays the price for our sin so we can be welcomed by God into his family forever. Jesus pays the price for this banquet. See, in the overall flow of the book of Isaiah, all the blessings offered to us here in Isaiah 55 flow from the death of Jesus described in Isaiah 53. Let me read some words from Isaiah 53, verses 4 to 5. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. See, God's grace is completely free to us because it cost Jesus everything. Now, the banquet of God's grace is open to all people and all nations, verse 5, because Jesus has paid the price for our sin and our shame. And the only question remaining is, How have you responded to this invitation from God? How are you responding to this invitation from God today in your life? Will you accept this invitation, thankfully, this this welcome from the God of grace? Or will you ignore it? Will you walk away from him? See, hundreds of years after Isaiah wrote these words, Jesus told people a parable about a great banquet. You can find that parable in Luke chapter 14. And in the story, a rich man invites people to a lavish feast. But the rich and the powerful people he invites, they all refuse the invitation. It's the poor and the broken who accept it. The warning Jesus has for us is clear. Don't be too proud to accept God's invitation here. Don't imagine you don't need the forgiveness of Jesus bought for you at the cross. Don't be too proud to admit that you are thirsty, that you are poor without a relationship with the God who made you for himself. Verses 1 to 5, God welcomes the thirsty and the poor through Jesus. But maybe you're sitting there today thinking to yourself, I don't think it's because I'm too proud that I don't go to Jesus. I think it's because I'm just too ashamed. I'm too ashamed of the things I've done, the things I've said, the ways in which I've treated other people. That is why I don't go near Jesus. I'm too ashamed to do it. Well, if that's how you're feeling today, let me say this. I believe verses 6 to 9 of Isaiah 55 are written for you. We can summarize the amazing message of those verses like this. God forgives everyone who comes to him through Jesus. God forgives everyone who comes to him through Jesus, verses 6 to 9. And when we say everyone, we mean everyone. So look at verses 6 to 7 for a minute here. Isaiah invites us all to come to God and to call on him. Verse 6, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. 
See, just like in verses 1 to 5, I hope we can see, there's a real sense of urgency here. Seek the Lord while he may be found, says Isaiah. Don't hang about. Don't keep putting it off. This is a decision you have to make. See, God's offer of forgiveness is genuine, but he won't force you to accept it. And his invitation isn't extended forever. There will come a point when it's too late to accept. So Isaiah urges us all here, don't wait too long. And then the first part of verse 7 describes for us the part we have to play in becoming a Christian. It's about turning away from our sin, from the life we used to live, ignoring and rejecting God, and turning towards the Lord. Coming near to him, calling on him, committing ourselves to living for him as our Lord. And elsewhere in the Bible, that, that, those two steps are described as repentance and faith. Turn away from sin and selfishness. Turn towards Jesus as Lord of your life. But then the second part of verse 7 tells us the part God plays in this process. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. Those are pretty emphatic promises about God's mercy and pardon. And it sort of begs the question, how can Isaiah be so certain, so confident that God will respond to sinful people the way he describes here? Well, the answer comes in verses 8 to 9. Because God is different to us. Because God doesn't treat us the way we think he will. Verses 8 to 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, these are quite famous verses, actually, and they're often quoted by Christians when we're grappling with God's sovereignty. So as Christians, we often struggle to understand exactly what God is doing in our world and in our lives. We struggle to trust his purposes in the middle of times like suffering. And so we quote verses 8 to 9 here. We say, well, God's ways are not our ways. We can't expect to understand everything God is doing in our world or in our lives. Instead, we have to trust him without understanding everything he's doing. Now, that is a wise and a right response to God's sovereignty. But the writer Dane Ortland, in his superb book, Gentle and Lowly, that came out last year, he really helped open my eyes to these verses and to understand them in the context of Isaiah 55. See, Ortland points out that these aren't primarily verses about the sovereignty of God at all. No, verses 8 to 9 are here about the compassion of God for sinners like you and me. These verses remind us just how different God actually is towards us than how we expect him to be. They tell us that God treats us very differently when we come to him in our sin than we would ever dream he would. See, again, we began our time today by admitting we often remake God in our own image. We imagine he's just a bigger version of us, like the Greek gods and goddesses. And as a result of that, when we mess up, when we sin, when we fail God and fail the people in our lives, we quickly presume God wants nothing to do with us. God will reject us if we go anywhere near him. But you see, The message of verses 8 to 9 of Isaiah 55 is given to us precisely for moments like that. His ways are not our ways, says Isaiah. His thoughts are not our thoughts. God doesn't treat us the way we think he will. Listen to how Dan Ortland puts it. Let me read from his book. He isn't like you. Even the most intense of human loves is but the faintest echo of heaven's cascading abundance. His heartfelt thoughts for you outstrip what you can conceive. 
He intends to restore you into the radiant resplendence for which you were created. And that is dependent not on you keeping yourself clean, but on you taking your mess to him. He doesn't limit himself to working with the unspoiled parts of us that remain after a lifetime of sinning. His power runs so deep that he's able to redeem the very worst parts of our past into the most radiant parts of our future. But we need to take those dark miseries to him. It's a beautiful passage and it is so life-changing for us to grasp. God isn't like you. And that is the best news you could ever hear. His ways are not your ways. God doesn't treat you as your sins deserve. God doesn't treat you the way your parents treated you or the way your friends treat you or the way people in authority have treated you. God doesn't treat you the way you treat other people when they hurt you. God doesn't reject you or keep his distance from you or turn his back on you. No, God wants you to take your mess to him. He wants you to come to him and ask him for mercy. He wants you to come to him so he can throw his arms around you and wash you clean. So he can remove your sins from you as far as the east is from the west. See, verses 8 to 9 tell us the God of the gospel is utterly unlike us in his grace and in his mercy. And that is why we can come to him with our sin, with our shame, with our suffering and ask him to forgive us and wash us clean and restore us. So how should we respond to this God of astonishing grace who is so holy, so unlike us? Well, Dan Lortland tells us, let's take our dark miseries to him. Let's not hide from him. Let's not keep him at arm's length. Let's draw near to God with confidence, knowing that his grace and mercy are greater than any sin that is in us. See, I hope we can see here, Isaiah 55 is a glorious message of hope and grace for everyone who trusts in Jesus. And in that, it's a glorious demonstration of the power of God's word celebrated in the closing verses of the chapter. Verses 10 to 13. Here we learn that God speaks words of life and hope to us through Jesus. God speaks words of life and hope to us through Jesus. So these closing verses, they're a celebration of God's life-giving, life-changing word. Verses 10 to 11. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You see, in Genesis, it was through God's word that God spoke the universe into existence. And here in Isaiah 55, he says, his word has lost none of its power. Nothing can frustrate God's words. It will always accomplish what God desires. God's word gives us life and nourishment, ultimately because God's word is written to lead us to the living word. The word made flesh, Jesus, the one who has paid the price fully, for our sin. So that is why we listen to God's word as a church family at Avenue. That's why we preach through God's word on a Sunday, why we read God's word together in home groups and in one-to-ones, why we read God's word on our own. See, God speaks words of life and hope into our lives through his word. So we want to be people who listen to his word. And what are the words of life and hope in this chapter? Well, God tells us that everyone who trusts in him will get to live in a glorious, restored, new creation as new, restored people, free from sin and death and pain. Just look at verse 12 for a minute. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. See, that is our future hope 
because of Jesus' death and resurrection. And even though we're not in that glorious new creation yet, we do catch glimpses of that new creation here and now as we live for Jesus. We experience foretastes of joy and peace with God and with one another as a church family. We catch glimpses of the transforming power of God's word in our lives as he slowly changes us and grows our love for him and our love for one another. So what should our response to God's words be here? Well, let's be people who listen to God's word more and more in our lives. Again, it is all too easy to remake God in our image. All too often we imagine God to be different to who he really is as he's revealed himself to us in Jesus. We either make him too harsh, too hard on us, or we make him too soft, too tolerant of our sin. But that is why we need God's word, the Bible. Because we need God to open our eyes and to keep opening our eyes to who he really is. Because only then will we go to God with all our sin and our shame and our suffering and ask him to forgive us and help us and wash us clean. See, we need to be people who listen to God's word because our greatest need is to see and worship and draw near to the God of grace we meet here. So what do we learn about this God of grace in Isaiah 55 as we finish? But we learn that he is the God who welcomes the thirsty and the poor through Jesus. We learn he's the God who forgives everyone who comes to him through Jesus. And we learn he's the God who speaks words of life and hope to us through Jesus. He is the God who alone can save and satisfy us. So let's go to him. Let's trust in him. Let's listen to him every single day of our lives. Let me finish with verses one to two again. The invitation of the God of grace. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labour on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest of fare. (laughs) 